the reason why I chose the name lean with question mark is because I have my doubts about it. I'm not a hundred percent lover of the lean startup and the lean methodology. Uh, are you all, uh, is everyone uh, 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 aware of how the lean startup methodology works? Could you please reply on the, on the text bes uh, beside? You're not, okay. No, cool. Okay, so it looks like the majority is not familiar with the Lean Startup. So I'm going to explain a bit about what it is. But before, I'd like you to read the quote uh, that you can see now on your screen. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn from the vast and endless sea. What does it mean, actually? Why did I choose this quote? There, there is a special reason, because it looks like uh, the author of this quote is trying to tell us that a project is not about finishing the product, uh, uh, but it is more about the people and the journey. How do you make for the people to want to go or to want to build where you want to arrive or what you would like to have? That's a very big question and has something to do with the concept of entrepreneurship and business. Uh, Mohammed, you cannot hear me. Uh, can everybody he uh, 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 hear me? You can. Yes, of course I can repeat. Okay, cool. So, if uh, most of us have the idea that when we are going to start up a business or an organization of any kind, uh, we need to s define what the project looks like, the people that we need, uh, which are the steps that we need to, uh, to take in order to arrive to a destination. It looks like the business or the organization is there to achieve something in particular, right? So innovate, present that product to the market, et cetera, et cetera. But Antoine de Saint-Exupéry is trying to say here with this quote, I think that Mohammed is a bit lost. Um, uh, yes, Jose, I will, Jose, I will connect him with our IT, okay? Okay, super. Okay. Okay, so uh, the author of this quote is trying to tell us something. It is not about the destination, so it's not about building a product or uh, achieving something. Uh, it's trying to tell us it's about the people, as uh, one of you said before. Uh, but when we talk about it is about the people, what do we mean? So I will let it there, and I would like to go to the next uh, slide. So when we are talking about business, uh, there are many interesting tools. One of them is the methodology proposed by the Lean Startup. Okay. Uh, and, well, the book is amazing. The, uh, the theory, it is also super interesting and is basically reflected in the, in the graphic that you can see. And it is, you build something that you want to sell. It can be a product or a service. You innovate. So you present it to the market. You measure what happens. You learn what is wrong. And you build again. So it is a never-ending cycle, right, of 
creation. There is a moment when you are going to arrive to uh, uh, the perfect match between uh, your product or service and the market needs. And at that moment is when you can make a good business. Now, although this is very interesting and and and, uh, uh, and powerful, it includes a very special um, assumption. And that assumption means that you are going to find uh, capital to fund the experimentation process of your business. Uh, how many of you are thinking to get an investor in order to make your business uh, uh, run? Could you type it? So I can repeat the question. How many of you are thinking to start up your business having an investor involved? You would, okay. Not at the moment. Okay, so we have basically two different groups, right? So the uh, some of us are more comfortable uh, bootstrapping. That means starting up our business from uh, uh, from the beginning with the resources that we have, investing our time. And some of us are more interested on uh, 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 getting an investor so that you can have enough space and funding uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, to grow your business. In that case, if you have an investor, the, the, the system of uh, the Lean Startup works pretty well. Okay, dokie. So, any question about this, this first part? No questions. Okay, everything is clear. So I go to the next one. I'm completely sure that you are uh, aware of the existence of the uh, business business model canvas. Um, so this is another tool that is super super interesting uh, because it pushes you to think a bit forward about what you want to do uh, uh, with your business. Now. I found that there are three specific areas, uh, actually four specific areas, that we have to pay attention to. So value proposition is one of them. Now, I don't want to go deep into, into, the, uh, uh, into this topic, but I want to explain you what I've learned, okay? So this is just a pure nectar of five years working with the business model canvas. And I will tell you what I did wrong, basically. Uh, here there's a question. What did I do in the measurement section? Uh, I don't understand the question. Can you rephrase, p uh, please, Asia? It doesn't matter. Just try with uh, different words. Okay, well, while you're right, I'm going to start confessing what I did wrong. So... Um, Value proposition is super duper important. But we must not confuse and take note of this. 
what is our value proposition and what is our value added you get it uh, most of us are trained to think about a business in a way of creating an original product or service something new we believe that we have higher chances of making more money or making more business if our product or service is extremely original and at the same time that we are lucky enough to hit a nerve in the market so that the market will respond and buy our product or service correct now that might be the value added and not the value proposition for example in my case I've been developing a, a set of interesting initiatives uh, uh, that are basically designed to support entrepreneurship. And I was asking myself, how come that the best potential customer for my service prefers to buy a beer and a pizza than coming to pay for a program, for example? What is, what is wrong there? So you see that if I want to make business, then I better start selling pizza and beer. If business is about making money, I should find out what is the first step in order to arrive to a, 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 a what I consider a, a, the vision of my company. But I should not confuse value proposition with value added. So what happens if I, instead of having a co-working space to support entrepreneurship, I have a restaurant and I decide to earn money through selling beer and pizza and at the same time create presentations or events uh, around the topic of entrepreneurship? Would it be better? Maybe. The final destination would be maybe to increase or to uh, uh, raise the sense of entrepreneurship in this city. But I would not have to convince anyone to buy my product that is the one that pays my salary. Uh, so, okay, call to attention again. Value proposition is essential. Understand first how are you going to make money. Second, add the value added that is in the, the innovative or the new or the original uh, approach to your business. Start with the first step. Obviously, once you have a value proposition, uh, you already know who your customer might be. Uh, so I advise you to define your customer after you get what is the value proposition and what is the first step of business that you want to do. Once you have your customers and, uh, and your value proposition, the next question is, which are your channels? Uh, yes, I can give an example. Uh, for example, uh, regarding customers, my value proposition is to train people to be more entrepreneurial, let's say, to put it simple. The beneficiary, the person that gets the benefit out of that service are, for example, young students. But the young students are not capable of paying for training courses, let's say. So who is going to be able to make the payment for that? For example, a municipality or a development agency from the state uh, or a school. So then I got what's the, wh who the customer is. Now, let's say uh, uh, a different case. What happens if I want the young student to be my customer? In, and do not have any intermediaries. 
if they are capable, if I know that they are able and capable to pay for the pizza that I'm selling, then they are my customer and that's fine. Because they are adjusted to my value proposition. That is beer pizza plus interesting contents about business. Is that clear now? I will assume it is. Uh, so once I have the, those customers, uh, we're going to assume that the, the, the students are those uh, 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 customers. How do I reach to them? That's a big question. Facebook is not the only channel. It can be one of them. What happens if I go to student organizations and partner with them? Because I know that they are interested on providing additional contents to their members. So that can be a channel. What happens if the city already organizes different kind of events uh, or have initi uh, different initiatives to support the same customer that I defined. Can I partner with them and include part of my contents? Then I get the channels. So we can call them partners, but basically they are channels because they are the ones that are helping me to transfer my value proposition to the customer. It's not necessarily a niche market, but it's who is already in the market attending my customer, who already has contact with them, who is capable of transferring my value proposition to them. Okay? And of course, now that I understand my value proposition, my customers, and my channels, then I have to definitely think about my revenue. So am I going to be selling, let's say for the first few months, we're going to be selling drinks and pizza. Am I going to add an additional revenue source? Like for example, renting the space to other potential speakers? Maybe that can be an additional revenue. Now the important thing on revenue is that it's not only an imagination. So, oh yeah, I'm completely sure people will love to pay for the pizzas and beers that I have here. Why? Why am I so sure? Are my pizzas different than any other pizza around? I don't know. So then I have to ask myself, from where do I get the information that my potential customer is going to come and pay for what I'm offering. So as soon as you start getting those answers, then you can fill in the space of revenue. And you can have as many different revenue sources as you wish. Then all the other parts of the canvas are easier to, uh, to fill. But from my perspective and experience, those are the four important spaces you have to consider. Is that clear? Do you have some question? Super. Anyone else? Okay, so then we move forward. Now, before asking this question that you can already see. When we're talking about tools for making business, you can find a lot. There are a lot, a lot of tools. There are a lot of books. There are a lot of uh, blogs, uh, uh, persons uh, that have more experience than you that would love to share with, uh, with you some experiences. But Nothing really matters if you don't know why would you like to start up a business or an organization. So can any of you write if you are sure that you want to start a business? A yes and no suffice. So you can type yes or no.
Okay, we have two yeses. Another yes. Super. Okay, so if if most of you want to start a business, ah, don't worry about failure. We're going to talk about this. Uh, if most of you would like to start a business, do you have any idea why you would like to do it? Because a lot of us are going to start with something like, um, I want to change the world. I want to make change in my environment. I want to inspire others. I want to grow. I want to be independent. Uh, let's see what, what else comes up. I want to be my own boss, for example. Uh, exactly, doing something that you love, right? You want to share your qualities, that's awesome. Exactly. So, do you remember that I was making some kind of emphasis on the value proposition side? And I was saying, you have to be sure that you understand what is your value added what is, uh, 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 and what is your business. If you want to start a business because you want to change the world, that's totally awesome and that's part of the, pro uh, 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 that's the, uh, of the purpose of your, of your organization or your initiative. But if you want to start a business, you have to be completely honest and say, I want to start a business to pay my salary so that I could be independent enough like uh, to pay my bills, to pay my rent, to make my business sustainable. Right, so you can think of people who use wheelchairs for independent life. Exactly. That, that, that kind of approach is, is awesome. That's what we call social entrepreneurship, right? So how my, act, my activities can uh, uh, create uh, value to people that uh, needs support, right? The truth is that uh, uh, we all need support of, in one or another side, but you must be completely honest. I lied to myself for many years telling that what uh, what I'm doing is for the others. And what happened uh, uh, after is that I had not enough money to continue the businesses. Right? So you start a business, as Natalie says, for you. You don't start a business for the others. The for the others is part of the value added. But that's not necessarily what is going to sell. If you are thinking to become a social entrepreneur and you want to attend the needs of persons that require support, you tell me, are those persons capable of paying for your services? Most likely not. So from where are you going to get the money to make your business self-sustainable? Okay, so that's, that's a very, very important thing that for some reason a lot of people forgot. We are very much into we want to uh, uh, be the best version of ourselves, create our maximum potential, uh, uh, help the others, make our planet better, uh, and all that is fine. All that is part of the of the purpose. But the first reason you want to uh, uh, to have for starting your business is basically uh, uh, to grow 
yourself as a person. Uh, government uh, government support, sponsorships, uh, uh, other kind of funding uh, uh, is essential, especially if you want to have a non-for-profit business. But you have to know that the income is uh, is not constant in all the cases, right? So uh, uh, and the, and the rules are uh, complicated. So. 100% go for that, but you will need to have something to offer to the market that is going to pay the basics, like your salary. Entrepreneurship is, from my point of view, a tool for per personal growth. And the personal growth, so as you grow, inspires others to grow as you are. Business is an additional tool that uses entrepreneurship and other set of knowledge. So you have to have it very clear. Okay? So if someone has a, a comment or, or a question, I'll be happy to answer before we move to the next slide. Okay, it looks like we can move to the next slide. Yeah, uh, you are talking about the. Uh, uh, it is hard for uh, uh, for some uh, citizens or uh, 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 individuals to get funding from the state, uh, and that depends very much on where you are. That's true, uh, but there are always uh, a lot of options. So I know from my partners in Macedonia, for example, that although the resources are uh, small. There are available. Uh, there are uh, 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 private uh, funds that uh, can support. There are agreements between uh, European Union institutions and local institutions. Uh, the same happens in Turkey uh, uh, and in other countries. I don't know about uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I guess there there has to be some kind of uh, a private uh, uh, source of funding as well. So you have to look for uh, foundations. Okie dokie. So we're going to talk about vision. And uh, I would like to ask you to do something. Um, so are, are you still awake? Can you please type yes if you are there? Okay, so it looks like the majority of us are awake. That's great. Um, now, I need you to close your eyes and imagine that you are waking up on your birthday number 70. Your birthday number 70. So you're opening your eyes there in your dream and I need you to imagine, visualize, what do you see? First of all, how is your, how is your room? <laughs> in the grave, I don't think so. Uh, how is your room? How is your bed? Let's start with it. Is, is someone else uh, uh, sleeping there beside you? So do you have a couple? Maybe you have two couples, I don't know. Uh, what, are, what are you going to, uh, to do? Are you standing up and going to the bathroom maybe to brush your teeth? Or are you making yourself sleeping uh, uh, so that they can come to your, uh, beside your bed or someone can come to you and, and sing happy birthday or or you are going to the kitchen and prepare a, 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 a coffee how is it your house or is it an apartment where is it I see that some some of you are imagining being in the coast 
or maybe in the mountains. Oh, Kreshumir, I have a very similar vision of future. Now, who is going to your party? It's, remember, it's number 70. It's quite a nice number. Are you inviting people from your job? Are you inviting people uh, 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 from your family or your friends? Uh, are your grandchildren and family members coming? So, okay, I, I, I'd like you to pay attention to the quality of your house. Kreshimur said that he has a boat. Is it a nice boat or a wonderful but old boat? Is your house very modern or very colorful? How is it? Okay, so now you have some kind of an image of how you would like to celebrate your birthday number 17, uh, uh, 70, 70. Is that right? I was sure you wanted a new boat, Kreshemir. Me too. Uh, awesome. So we could go deeper and deeper into this visualization, but I just wanted you to have... Uh, this uh, a small version of this practice uh, but I I would encourage you to do it again uh, maybe on Saturday when you wake up uh, and take yourself a time take yourself like an hour imagining how that day would be and once you do it I would like you to go to see this canvas and I'm going to explain it to you in a in a in a fast fashion because uh, uh, I have so many things to share with you that uh, uh, I'm afraid we will not have enough time so I call this practice the vision of present okay and the vision of present is about how do you bring that vision of future that you made now of when you have 70 years old to become part of your day to day? You might say, well, Jose, are you crazy? I mean, I was just imagining a normal day, you know, uh, uh, receiving some people, having some good food, uh, uh, having my, my super beautiful new boat, uh, etc. Uh, but you won't believe each one of these components of your dream have a reason. Therefore, if you make a list, uh, yeah, I'm sure that you are going to receive uh, 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 that you're going to receive this PowerPoint, so you can print it from there. Otherwise, you can write me to. Jose at fianfeld.com and I, I will reply you with a PDF version. Okay? So, once you have this dream, I'd like you to list the five or ten most important elements. For example, in my case, I woke up Beautiful bed, very simple, white linen. My wife was sleeping there. I stand up and go to the kitchen to prepare myself a coffee. And I'm happily surprised because there's a chocolate cake there waiting for me. So then Tatiana, my wife, comes and sits with me. I serve the coffee. She says, happy birthday. She sings to me. And we start getting ready for uh, my children to come that they are going to come with their wives. I have two boys. And uh, I guess that for at that age, I will already have some uh, 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 grandchildren. My house is pretty modern, but very small. It is not where I live now. It is in the uh, region of mountains here in Slovenia. I have a boat, 
I have a nice car. The boat, the boat is already on top of my car, so I can transport it to the lake. Uh, and I'm going to have a pretty nice party. Very good food, something like 20 persons that are from my company, from my job, my partners, right? Friends and whoever from my family that can come here. Remember, I'm Peruvian, so probably not all of them will be able to make the trip. So from that dream, I can see that for me it's important to be close to the people that works with me and uh, mix that group of people with my family. For me it's important to be in the mountains because it gives me a sense of adventure. Uh, having a small house to me means uh, not having to clean so much or taking too much care of maintenance of a big space. Uh, okay, you, you get it, right? So those important things, you are going to list them there in the section that says main elements of your vision. Then on the right column, you, say, you, you have a title that says associated value or principle. So for example, the sense of adventure that gives me the location of where am I going to live, in this case the mountains, gives me a sense of freedom. So the value that I find connected with that uh, 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 element is freedom. Having a small house so that it's easier to maintain gives me more time, gives me a sense of freedom as well. Having my family and friends together is basically the same to me. So is this a value of family? Do I value family? No, I actually value more belonging. Okay, you get the idea. So you are going to be making a mental connection between the main elements of your vision and values or moral principles that you have in your mind. You might get surprised as I did because I found that most of my values are focused on freedom. And that's the reason why I get pissed when people interrupt me or when people come to tell me, we need you urgent, you have to do this or that. Because they break my freedom. I want to help, so I have to stop doing what I wanted to do in order to support them. Right? So, to me, everything is freedom. And there are a few other things. So, where is equality? Where is justice? Uh, in my canvas, it's not there. And that doesn't mean that it's not important for me. Of course it is important. But those are not the values I'm living my life with. So this is the first moment when you are going to break uh, uh, the illusion of the values you would like to live in your life and the values that you really live in your life. Awesome. So now let's go to the vision of present. Everything clear so far? Okie dokie. So Disney World has a vision that is very interesting. Uh, their vision of future of their vision is we want to make people happy. So the question is when can you make people happy? Obviously, they can make people happy today. And what happens if for some reason all the Disney movies and uh, uh, amusement parks disappear from the planet? Can the people that works for Disney still make people happy? What do you think?
They can, right? Because they can go out to the street and make jokes. Or they can go out to the street and uh, uh, entertain people, play music. So the vision of present is exactly that. Is, yeah, there's a limit, of course. But your day has a limit as well, correct? But as you are capable of making people happy or achieving your vision today, you add every single day a layer of growth and satisfaction towards your vision of future, right? Obviously, Disney has other objectives as well. They have uh, uh, goals, they have uh, uh, business visions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that they also want to achieve. But let me compare with the vision of uh, Ford. Ford had a vision of uh, becoming the number one provider of uh, uh, services and products for the auto industry in the world, something like that. So if you ask when, the answer is in the future, right? And even if you arrive to that future, what happens then? Some, the competition is going to try to get your number one. Therefore, your vision is never coming to reality. It has something of positive because it's motivating looking forward for that. But at the same time, it can be a, a humongous source of anxiety. Okay, so at least in this uh, 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 exercise, what I would like you to practice is to find from your vision of future what can it can fit written in present tense in the three aspects that the vision of present side tells you. So a personal vision, a professional vision, and a social impact vision. The short phrase. Okay? In my case, it's raising entrepreneurship in the three cases. And if one of you, for example, today learn something or get inspired by what I'm saying or get a new idea or get curious about a, a topic that we are talking today, I'm going to feel very good. And when I go home and I evaluate my day, that vision of the day has been somehow achieved. Okay? And uh, therefore, I feel pretty good. We are like trees. We grow layer by layer. So this vision of present sight is going to help you somehow uh, connect that vision of future to the present. But that's not all. Uh, so far, some question. Okay, no question so far. So the next step in your vision of present is about designing what you need to do in your day. I call them placeholders. Okay, so that means that are not uh, elements designed to produce a particular result. Uh, result. It's not, we're not talking about goals or tasks. We're talking about placeholders, spaces of time where you are going to do something. Okay? So, for example, uh, sleeping, how many hours? Eight hours. Cool. Eating, for me, is super important because I love food, so I don't want to be in a rush, and I'm going to put two hours of uh, eating. Uh, another one is going to be reading, because I love reading. And reading every day or listening a, a podcast is super good for me. Uh, so I want to have an hour for reading. I want to have two hours of sales-oriented activities. 
Because at the end of the month, if I'm not selling, I'm going to ask myself, hey, Jose, did you invest the time on selling? Mm, no. Okay, so don't, don't, don't complain. Right? Okay, so those are the general actions. Those are the placeholders. But now the hardest thing is going to be to connect those placeholders with the vision of present reach. That means if it is present, sorry, personal, professional, or social. And you are going to make the connection with the values of principles that or principles that you have in the vision of future section. So the idea is that you see that throughout your day you are going to be dedicating time to each one of the aspects, so the reach and the principles or values that you talked before. And uh, that's it. It is going to give you a very big source of reflection. You might be even uh, 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 ready to understand why some things were not working in the past. Uh, some questions so far? I'll be happy to answer. Everything clear? Okay. Cool. So, this question becomes relevant now, right? Because you've seen that the practice that we made before is very much about you. It might have something to do with your job or your personal uh, uh, activities in your business, but it's not necessarily a vision of present and a vision of future of your business itself. Can you do the same practice that we saw before for your business? Of course you can. And it is awesome. The results are amazing. The discussions with the people are just incredible. So please do that. But you have to find out what is the relationship between your business and yourself. You have a purpose. Maybe you don't know how to put it in words, but you have a purpose that you are living since the beginning. And your business has a purpose that is helping you to grow, supporting your purpose. So don't ever forget about this question. Because when you get into a job situation that makes you feel as this is not what I like, this is not what I want. I'm feeling abused. I'm feeling exhausted. If you ask this question again, you might find the reason why you're feeling like that, and you might find some tools or answers to solve the situation. Okie dokie. So, someone mentioned the word failure. Can you write from 1 to 10 how important is failure when 10 is super important? Anita says 10. G uh, uh, Sandra, 8. Kreshimir, 8. Jiva, 8. Two more people are typing. Natalie, 10. So, yeah. So, basically, everyone believes that failure is super, super, super important. Now, then try to explain me how come that my country, Peru, and the rest of the countries around, South American countries, are still a mess. How come? They fail 
since I remember. And my father is telling me that they are failing at the same things forever. Exactly. We don't learn from our failures. So why is important failure? Because we have a fear that is called fear of failure. And because failure is somehow stigmatized, so we are avoiding to fail. Uh, one of the Lean Startup uh, uh, principles is to fail fast and to learn how to fail better. And I have to agree with that. That means that when you fail at something, it can be something very simple. I didn't make the telephone call to this potential customer. Or I didn't pay my taxes even I have the money. I just, it, I just got late. Uh, or uh, I had to close the company and fire 100 persons. Uh, so failure can be seen in very different ways, okay? Uh, but if we go mentally into trying to solve why we failed, we are going to come up with a, a logical and rational answers. For example, we didn't have the right team. Uh, I was too much of a perfectionist. Uh, we didn't have enough time to understand our team and their personal needs, etc. You can come up with a lot of interesting uh, things. But in the example I made about Peru failing all the time and never learning, there is a component that is very important. They want to change. They want to solve the problems. But the problems come back again. So everything that our mind is capable of explaining why we failed is basically uh, a superficial argument and reasons of that refer to external circumstances. Okay, so the uh, politics changed, the etc. You understand? Uh, those are circumstances. Amazingly, the circumstances can change, but we can do the same mistakes again. Because what we're going to try to avoid the next time are the same circumstances. So here is where it comes a different concept that I love so much. And is fear. Fear is not only fear to heights or spiders or these kind of things. Fear is much deeper. Uh, wait a second. So uh, let me see the comments. Yeah. Uh, Anita, the funny thing is that many times in our life we fail at the same thing with different circumstances. So what can we do to stop failing at the same thing? What can we do to break those, those cycles so that we are not listening ourselves complaining about the same thing over and over again across decades? The answer is understanding fear. So, if you don't pay attention to your fears, that lack of attention might be responsible for producing a failure. Unattended fear is often the source of failure. That's personal, that's in the personal case. But can an organization or a team of people 
fail because of unattended fear? And the answer is yes, because we have collective fear that is part of the culture of an organization. Okay? Cool. So, um, let me tell you an example. Uh, so, I'll put myself comfortable. Okay, okay. So, for example, my father is a very strong uh, a character. He has a very strong character. And he's very focused on success, professional excellence. And as I said before, I'm very unstructured. I'm more of a creative kind of person. My father is not creative, he's very much structured. So he would always get disappointed with my achievements because they were not on the level of what he expected. But anyway, I love my father and I admire him. Therefore, I lived my life trying to prove that I'm good enough, even for his high expectations. Unfortunately, that, create a, that created a fear on me. Because if my father thinks that I'm not good enough like to reach his expectations, what happens with the rest? Is it possible that I'm not good enough for the rest as well? So my answer was, my internal answer was yes. So there is a fear, a fear of not, good, not, not being good enough. So what is the effect of that fear? Very simple. I create my business to try to prove my father that I can make a living. But then when I'm not making it, I'm feeling extremely anxious and, and depressed. When I'm making it, I try to tell my father immediately uh, of my success. But at the same time, when I want to go out and sell my product, I'm not so sure how to sell. I don't feel comfortable because I'm not sure if the potential customer is going to see me as good enough. Do you get it? Those are fears, and that is how they are limiting ourselves. So, uh, Kreshimir mentioned that fear is natural defending mechanism. It, keep, it, it keeps you being careful. Uh, one has to have uh, a dose of fear. That's true, but we're not talking about uh, 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 survival. We're not talking about the fear of not falling, not falling to the precipice. We are talking about the fears that are capable of limiting our actions, okay? Uh, so why? So let's let's make a, a, a simpler example. I go to a pub. I'm single, and I'm looking for a potential partner. I w look at this beautiful lady, and I don't feel like I'm, I can talk to her. There is a fear there. It's not only practice, there is a fear. But as soon as I realize that I have this fear of being uh, uh, not good enough from the judgment of the others, I can start working on that fear and understanding how that fear limited my actions and, in this case, my business. Can we do the same in an, in a, with a team? Yes, we can. We were two perfectionists, for example, right? So why are we perfectionists? Why do we think we have to be the best? Is it possible that in the back of that perfectionism there is an insecurity? Okay, what are we collectively insecure of? So fear becomes yeah, low self-esteem is one of these things. Fear becomes a friend. So, in opposition to the example of Kreshemir, that is survival fear, once 
we go into the other kind of fears that we're talking about, you start looking at fear as an area where you need to pay more attention. So is it true that I need to be the best person in order to sell my products? Is it true that my father has to come to tell me, yes, that's a good product in order for me to sell it? Of course not. That explanation, that answer, starts increasing my self-esteem. It makes me feel more secure about myself. Therefore, it's like lighting a candle inside of a dark room. Little by little, I'm going to be able to see the whole room with one candle. Find the door, open the door, and let the rest of the light come in. Then that fear disappears, and that's, that's what we call growth. That's when we grow. That's when we find out one aspect of our life that is now resolved. Is not long, no longer limiting us. So don't forget about fear because in your path as an entrepreneur, fear is your best friend. I'm going to explain a bit more. So far, some question. Uh, okay, so here there's one, one comment. So you're using a wheelchair uh, and you have some walking equipment. Uh, you're, uh, you're afraid of falling. Are you afraid of falling? Or are you afraid of what the people think when they see you uh, uh, on the floor? Because I'm completely sure that you fell many times. Correct. So why do you think you are afraid of the people looking at you when you're on the floor? Maybe because you think that they are going to think, oh, poor guy, or, oh, it's sad that he cannot stand up by himself. So, okay, your answer is no. So I, I you don't need to say what's the reason, but if you go through those questionings, you might find that there's some kind of a shame or there's some kind of uh, 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 indifferent, whatever it is, that might be the source of a fear. So, and, and you know what? And to continue with that thought, remember, your fear is trying to tell you that there's a change that needs to happen or that there's a change that is going to happen, okay? But is your mind the one that is thinking and trying to understand what the fear is trying to say? Okay? So your mind comes up with these things like, I'm afraid of falling. But that is not true. Maybe I don't try enough. Maybe my fears stops me from that. Okay? So there might be many reasons, but we could go very deep here uh, uh, in this topic. So let's go to the next slide. So Okay, cool. Uh, of course, there's never ending. Once you find the fear and you resolve it, then you can always go deeper and find more. But that's the beauty. And the image that you are watching right now is exactly about that. So when we decide to be entrepreneurs or business persons, when we decide to marry, when we decide to become a mother or a father, we are ready to make a decision. That decision is required because we need to build up strength in order to face change. Okay? So 
there's uh, uh, we have 15 minutes more. Okay, so you are always going to have to make a decision when you are faced to change. Okay, you are going to experience resistance, and then you have two options: or you face it and you go forward and make the decision, or you normalize it. So you rationalize the idea and you don't make the decision or you decide to not change, okay? That happens always, it is a cycle. So the path of the entrepreneur is about facing change constantly, therefore making decisions all the time and not normalize it, face it, face it, and face it. So that's uh, 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 that's very important, especially when you already know how fear works. Now, as we have short time and we have still a lot of uh, slides, I'm going to start going a bit faster here. But I think that we we talked about the centerpiece of the spirit of the entrepreneur. Uh, the images that you see in front of you are all part of a framework that I, I call it the framework for innovation. But today I'm going to talk only about one of these components that is empowerment. I'm going to make it very simple. Empowerment starts with you and ends with you. You cannot empower anybody else. It's very similar than the word help. You can help yourself, but you can't help others. Uh, there, we can have a philosophical discussion about that, but let's assume that my definition is correct. If empowerment starts with you and ends with you, what is this about? Empowerment means I have and I am everything what is needed for experiencing a wonderful life, a meaningful life, experiencing happiness, fulfillment. Uh, so if you know that you are going to do crazy things. You are going to start up your company and take risks because you know that you have everything what is needed. And that you have all the energy and the power. That's why it's called empowerment. So here you have it. Entrepreneurship is a process of constant change, struggle, and achievement. Constant. It's like being a hero. The people will like you for your struggle because they are going to learn that even it is difficult, it is possible. That's empowerment. Okay? Good. Then, well, uh, uh, those are some questions for you to find your personal fears. I'm sure you're going to receive the PowerPoint later. Now, let me talk about culture. What happens when you go into a very fancy store, uh, a Hugo Boss kind of store? Uh, a lot of us feel uncomfortable, feel like, oh my God, I don't belong here. That's culture. That feeling that is in an environment is part of the culture. What happens when I go to the office of Google Oh my God, that's so awesome. That's culture. So culture is something that happens where humans are. And you have basically two options. Or you create that culture on purpose, or you let it happen. Culture is going to happen where people is. But I personally recommend you that when you are thinking on having your own business, to the, that you should think on what is the culture 
you want the others to feel. Okay? So welcoming culture, etc. Uh, we have different ways of managing businesses. So you have hierarchies, you have holacracy that is a bit more flat kind of way of managing a business. It doesn't matter. You can choose whichever way you want. But the most important question is who's the shaman? Yeah, it's not a mistake. We all know that someone has to be the manager of the company. The manager is a person that takes care of resources, of schedules, of all the practicalities of the business. It is essential. But who is the person in charge of the people? So you can say, okay, the human resources persons are. But is the human resources person have the same authority than the manager? So here am I pre I'm presenting to you an alternative that is a system where authority is divided in two, the managerial and the human or personal side. Both of them are some kind of a conflict, but at the same time, they make a wonderful balance of interests. And that's how the humans organized themselves in the past. So it's very much embedded in our way of being. Don't forget about the shaman. Uh, some questions uh, so far? Is it too crazy, this idea? Are you still awake? <laughs> Super. So for example, me as a founder of my own initiatives, I'm very much of a shaman. I'm very much of a shaman. But Tanya, that is the person that works with me, is very much of a manager. So sometimes I go more on the human side, and she wants to go more on the organizational side. So because both of us have the same authority, we have to come up with an agreement. And that agreement is therefore beneficial for how we manage the business and how we take care of our people. That, it, it is wonderful. Um, and actually, there are a lot of uh, research studies about uh, uh, including uh, traditional ways of human organization into companies because we feel like the managers are identified also as leaders, right? When And we get confused with the concept of authority. So are they the, the, the leaders because they have the authority? Is because he's the manager the leader, and we all get confused. But if we understand that the role of the manager is not necessarily to be the leader, uh, a lot of problems get solved. And actually, I asked managers from big companies, what happens if I tell you that you don't need to be the leader anymore, that you can only be the manager? And they said, we pay you whatever you want because the weight and the heavy weight of being a leader is extremely difficult. Is it more clear now? Yes, okay. We move forward, okay? So feel free to ask questions at any at, at any moment. I'll be happy to answer questions after this event is over as well. So I want to present you uh, an idea uh, that we have to go very fast. 
that is an understanding of human interactions. And that's very important if you want to have a culture uh, of innovation. First of all, you see in the lower part the section of culture. Our culture presents us with external factors and with reasons to be afraid. Fear is our default, default culture. Our culture supports interpersonal relationships, right? Where individuals interact. Now, you have to imagine every individual as being inside of a glass bottle. And the bottles of each one of the persons is thicker or thinner according to different circumstances. Those thicknesses, so the thickness of the glass, is going to affect how we perceive uh, uh, our reality. How do we uh, perceive the messages? So in this case, uh, this group of people, so all of you, are coming from very different cultures, right? From three different continents, basically, of our planet. So it is very likely that what, I'm, what I want you to know or to get from my message is different than what you think I want you to know and is also different from what you learned. So we have a very big disadvantage. Exists a, a, an issue of communication that is permanent and it always happens. So there's a trick. As soon as we are capable of relating each other as humans, in a human level, as soon as we are capable of showing some kind of vulnerability, an instinct comes into our rescue, and that instinct is called empathy. And empathy starts by the understanding that we all feel the same. We feel fear in the same way. We experience love in the same way. We experience pain in the same way. We are humans. When that happens, the thicknesses of our glasses gets thinner. That's why when we are having fun with our friends, communications goes much smoother. There's not much resistance. But when we empathize with people, uh, the way we communicate is much better. That's a huge trick. In order to uh, follow up with this, I propose you to align with your team the definitions that are important for you in the following way. What is leadership? Define it. What is authority? Define it. Now compare them both. What's the relationship between leadership and authority? And write one short phrase. And the same for every single definition that is important for your organization. Once you do that, you are going to have aligned the important definitions inside of your team and you're going to be able to communicate more effectively. Uh, we have two minutes, so I'm going to run fast. Uh, when you talk about innovation, leadership, authority, and these big words that are important for your business and designing your culture, do not think of them as ideas. It's better that you think of them as processes. So how to do that is amazing. It's amazing and it's super amazing. Which are the conditions for innovation, leadership, authority, creativity, inclusion, whatever you want? Which are the conditions for those concepts to naturally emerge? That's the question that you need to answer for each one of these words that, are, that is important. And I'm going to give you one short example. If you plant a seed of a tomato plant, 
which are the conditions for that tomato to grow and uh, flourish. You know, good soil, enough water, enough light. And it, you will see that if you have all those conditions plus some additional ones, you are going to end up having tomatoes. So how do you make your organization more effective? You have to ask, which are the conditions for that to happen? Okie dokie. Let's... Uh, Okay, so actually, basically, we are basically at the end. And guys, the deepest advice I could provide to you is business has to be, must be easy. Because business is the transaction, is what do I have that you want to buy? Business is easy. Purpose value added is harder. So do not equate the hardship of what you want to achieve, like what you said at the beginning, right? Changing the world, helping others, etc., etc., right? That's hard. Don't equate that hardship with your capacity of making money because they are two different things. And if you want to engage in uh, uh, entrepreneurship, always ask yourself, who made the rules? <laughs>